The Tom Woods Show, episode 2137. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I'm giving away three free courses from my Liberty Classroom. One of them is ex-Marxist Michael Rechtenwald teaching you about critical theory so you can understand leftism and fight it better, as well as our course on how Alexander Hamilton screwed up America and the history of the conservative and libertarian movements. Check it out at 3freecourses.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Finally, I have an episode for you about what happened in Reno, Nevada over the weekend, last weekend, regarding the Libertarian National Convention, where I had the opportunity to speak at a special breakfast, and it was great, had a big packed room, and said a lot of things that needed to be said. So a lot of fun for me personally, but the real message here is not about the fun that I had, but the seismic shift that took place in the party. And the credit for that shift belongs to a group of people who were told over the past few years that they were never going to win and that history was stacked against them or whatever kind of melodramatic stuff they were told and couldn't have been more wrong. And I'm talking, of course, about the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party, which, shall we say, had an extremely successful weekend. I don't know how you could have a more successful weekend. And I'm talking today with Michael Heiss, who is the founder of the Mises Caucus. And the idea behind the Mises Caucus was we want to keep the legacy of Ron Paul alive. And that means we need different messaging, different leadership in the Libertarian Party, fearless. We don't want a Libertarian Party whose messaging sounds like a ransom note. You know, it sounds like it was written with a gun to their heads or whatever, saying kind of, eh, kind of what the regime, stuff the regime won't really disapprove of that strongly. Or certainly you're not going to go two years under COVID and not say anything about it or barely say anything. We need boldness and we need, we need a Ron Paul message. And we'd also like the national leadership to stop smearing our most influential and popular voices. You know, not like we're asking a whole lot here. We want libertarian messaging and stop attacking decent people and having your social media be embarrassingly milk toast and blue pilled. Michael, would you say that is a reasonable summary of the motivation behind the caucus? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's keeping, as you said, the Ron Paul legacy alive through the LP where it should be because we all know that it will never be held together in the GOP. You know, and to kind of front on that messaging of decentralization, property rights, Austrian economics, and really just restore the vision of the Libertarian Party back to its founding. Somewhere along the way here, it's been made to be overly political. And, you know, I understand the surface level truth and political parties are there to elect candidates. But, you know, if you go back and look at videos of the founders of the the party, like David Nolan, they overtly said that winning elections or getting ballot access and all this was not the actual goal of the party. It was secondary to spreading the message and changing the culture and that things like ballot access and winning elections are a necessary byproduct of infecting the culture, but that is the primary goal there. So it's restoring the vision to its original founding. It's keeping the spirit and the energy and the legacy of the Ron Paul revolution alive and keeping the intellectual core as started by Mises and run through Rothbard and celebrated in the Mises Institute at the forefront of the party to inform our strategy and inform our thinking. Of course, the philosophical question here is precisely what is the purpose of the Libertarian Party? I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I want to talk about what happened in Reno, but the whole thing about is it to win elections or is it to educate the public? I don't see why it can't be both. Why don't you do both simultaneously? But the key thing is it can't just be win elections because then I, you know, we could just nominate any old schmo who just happens to be popular because he's a celebrity or something. And then what would the point of the party be then if you're just electing people for the sake of electing them? But the funny thing is this whole lecture about the purpose of a political party is to elect candidates is coming from people who have had a terrible record electing candidates. You know, they they occasionally elect somebody dog catcher and they act like it's the best achievement in the history of the world. So they're not even that particularly good at it. And it's hard, by the way, in a two-party system where most people think in terms of two parties, it's hard to elect candidates. I get that. I'm not, I'm not making fun of them for that. I'm saying that their record is so poor, for them to lecture us on the purpose is to elect candidates seems a little bit rich. And I would say that if you are going to have any hope of ever electing anybody other than somebody in the 
two major parties. You're going to have to do it with much, much bolder and edgy messaging than basically leftism plus free trade. I don't see how that's ever going to work. No, it can't work. And a chronic problem is that in the party has been that there is no plan. There is no long-term strategy, and there's not really an incentive to implement a long-term strategy because fundamentally the party and its governing structure is run off of democracy. And as we know through Hoppe's work and others, that the incentives of democracy, basically they appeal to the lowest common denominator. And I think that exists within the Libertarian Party. You know, right now we elect new leadership every two years, and you know, maybe six months before that election, they're going to state conventions and they're campaigning and they're reseeking. And that really only gives you a year and a half to be doing other work uninterrupted. And there's turnover all the time and there's just no real way to carry out a long-term plan. And that is one of the strategic goals of the Mises Caucus is to not privatize the LP, but sort of quasi-privatize the LP. Or maybe privatize isn't the right word, but have a nationwide organizational apparatus such that the democratic process becomes predictable. And the more predictable it comes, the wider time horizon you can work with to implement a long-term plan. So when they talk about, well, the purpose of a political party is to win elections, they're throwing spaghetti at the wall and they're you know, running for anything and everything. You know, They're running for state senate because that's what political parties do. And they're running for inspector of elections. And there's not really much strategy, whereas our strategy is to focus on, in particular, City council, sheriff, mayor, judge, school board. Very specifically positions that, if won, could nullify the feds because the feds are the great evil and decentralizing from the feds is the big goal. So that's our approach, is to raise money, find viable candidates for those types of positions, arm them with legislation, kind of taking stock of their demographic, whether it's a blue town or red town, give them corresponding legislation where, you know, if they're in a red town, the people on the ground, the rank and file, they probably really do like their gun rights, but maybe they're not getting delivered on that by the political class of that town. So we can then arm those people with, say, a gun sanctuary ordinance and be the catalyst to implement those changes on the ground. So I would say that's a lot more of a fleshed out strategy than the throwing everything at the wall thing that you have seen for the past forever in the party. Right, right, right. And you can work with the 10th Amendment Center and stuff like that. You can work with Sheriff Max, Constitutional Sheriff and Peace Officer Association. There are a lot of people with a lot of knowledge who, of course, would normally be shut out of the Libertarian Party because they're not fashionable and, you know, they're not at the Jerome Powell cocktail party. So they're, you know, <laughs> neither is the Libertarian Party for that matter. But, <laughs> but anyway, all right. So let's talk about what actually happened at the convention. Now, we're going to skip over all the organizational work you did to make this possible, you know, with your colleagues in the various states. Maybe we'll get to that later. Let's talk about the actual convention. So there's some training on the Thursday, but the real convention begins with the gavel on a Friday morning. And, you know, of course, a lot of people are watching the live stream to see, is the Mises Caucus going to live up to the promise? In 2020 and before that, we didn't quite get what we wanted, but we were growing. But going into 2022, it looked like it was ours to lose. And if we had lost... I think the momentum would have just been shot. I think it would have been very, very hard to get people to wait two more years and keep on struggling. So talk me through Friday. Well, yeah, what you said was definitely the concern. That was the fear that had us working 12, 14-hour days, (laughs) ensuring that this did happen. But in the first day, you know, well, in the run-up to it, we had a 70-page document that we were training all of our delegates on called our strategic action plan. And this painstakingly went through every single thing that we planned on doing from the floor, how we were going to do it, why we were going to do it, and what was all the parliamentary jargon that made it so that everyone knew this was within the confines of the rules. So ahead of time, I just accepted that there's no way that we're going to email everybody, all of our delegates. There's about 820 people who were Mises Caucus that were elected either as delegates or as alternate delegates that this went out to. So I knew that it was going to be released. And of course it was. And so they, they knew what was coming, and, but I wasn't really concerned about that. We were confident that we were going to have 60%, 62%, something like that. So Friday comes, and one of the first things that we had in our agenda is that we knew that there was going to be a credentialing fight because, not to get too much in the weeds, but essentially there's been multiple states where there have been attempts by haters to more or less steal those state parties or steal the email accounts of those state parties or steal the the organizational software from those state parties or steal literal physical assets 
from those state parties or purge members that we had to overcome in the run up to the convention. So there was challenges to some of these states, not as many as we anticipated. My state of Pennsylvania was challenged and that ultimately failed. And then Massachusetts was challenged and then that ultimately failed. And that seemed to take the wind out of their sails on that particular maneuver, which led us to the other thing that we wanted to do. And this was the only thing that we really didn't succeed in in the entire convention, but it was, we tried to replace the chair and that did not work because the vice chair spoke against it and said that he didn't want to chair the meeting. And the the reason that we went to remove the chair from presiding over the convention is just the absolute bias and vitriol that she had displayed in the run-up. I mean, she cast the deciding vote to remove Karen Ann Harlos from the board, and and she just did it with uh, absolute vitriolic glee. And she had tried to have the Pennsylvania delegation removed as delegates through the what's called the credentialing committee before we ever even got there. And there, she was sympathetic to the states like Massachusetts that had purged 47 members. And so there was just no way that we were going to get a fair hearing. And sure enough, she was acting how we expected. She was ignoring what's called points of order. She was ignoring objections and ignoring appeals to the ruling of the chair. This is all parliamentary jargon. And it became clear that I wasn't going to be able to work a microphone and that everything that I was going to do was going to be just ignored. So we had suffered a setback with that. And, you know, we actually were kind of nervous once that failed that maybe we had lost the room, you know, that maybe we we looked like jerks in the minds of people for trying to get rid of the chair and, you know, failing at that. But it wasn't long after that where we got, I think, what was the decisive victory of the entire convention, which is we changed the agenda. And we changed the agenda such that the LNC races were put first. And that kind of recaptured the room, put us back on track and set the tone for the rest of the convention, which from the opposition side, just continued to get worse and worse as the convention went on. Friday night, the Mises Caucus had a bash that involved some really great speakers. They had Daniel McAdams from the Ron Paul Liberty Report, Zuby, the guy I've had on this show, who's a, he's not just a rapper, he's a fitness guy, he's a content creator, he's a podcaster, all around one man show, very successful, a great guy to hear from, Maj Touré from Black Guns Matter, of course, Dave Smith, I spoke. Scott Horton was the MC. Angela McArdle. And then, of course, capped off by Ron Paul himself. There was so much energy in that room. And that, that you know, we had laughs, we had cheers. This was where the energy was, not with the PC scolds and the you're not doing it rights and, and whatever. Our people was where the fun was. So when did we find out that Angela was elected chair? It was Saturday, wasn't it? It was Saturday, but we all but knew that she was going to win by Friday night because business had let out at five o'clock. And then for an hour after that, you have what's called regional caucuses. And basically the Libertarian Party, they have chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer. They have five at-large representatives. But then the states are all broken into regions. And there were eight regional representatives. And then there's also eight regional alternate representatives who don't actually have a vote on the board unless the regional representative does not show up. and six out of the eight elections for those regionals were held on Friday before our bash. And we swept all of them, which was a very, very strong indicator that the fear that we had of that maybe we lost the room, not removing the chair was assuaged. And we felt very, very confident at that point that we were going to take everything because when you're voting at large and we have the raw data to say, okay, we're 62%, the demographic of the delegation switches when you're looking at region to region. Now, we had good data on that. There was a couple that we weren't sure of, but we took all of them. And that gave us the confidence to say, okay, we're going to bull this thing over. And that's kind of the energy and enthusiasm that we took into that, that bash on Friday night. And one observation that I have made that you're, I think you're kind of getting at with the energy in the room is that we, the caucus, seem to have a community element to us that has otherwise been lacking within the Libertarian Party. And I am at a point now where I actually believe that that community element, that those bonds that those people have, where they they enjoy the fight because they enjoy being with each other and they believe in the message and, and all of that, I think that's actually the driving force to our success. And I'm now at a belief that Whatever the strategy is, whether it's the GOP, whether it's the LP, whether it's agorism, whether it's issue work, whatever it is, 
all of them are, I believe, now doomed to fail if you don't have the community element. I actually think that that is the most important thing now. Oh, yeah. Every, but now all the cool kids want to belong to this thing. You know, and it's so interesting for me, growing up a nerd, suddenly <laughs> being a cool kid. This is not anything I'm used to. And I look at... Now, not everybody who is outside the caucus proper is an uncool kid. I can think of several people who are definite allies, but who just, for whatever reason, they're not in it, and that's okay. But I am thinking about the people who, oh, well, well, this guy said this on his podcast, and this one. Okay, you can either be hanging out with those goody-two-shoes nerds, or you can be with Dave Smith and Scott Horton and Angela McArdle, who are genuine badasses. And by the way, can you imagine there would be anybody in the world who doesn't like Scott Horton, like the best <laughs> anti-war voice we have in the entire movement, and he's on our side, and all these utterly, absolutely, absolutely unimpressive nobodies calling him or anybody else a, quote, fascist or whatever. I mean, these are really very tragic people, honestly. You know, I mean, they've got nothing to, honestly, nothing to show for themselves. And they want to go and attack a group of us who can boast a guy as impressive as Scott Horton, not to mention the whole rest of our crew. They're very, very tragic people. Yeah, and there's kind of these layers that we, I hate to reduce people to this, but there's kind of these layers that you can look at people from our perspective of like, you've got your Mises people, you've got your friendlies, you've got your neutrals, and you've got your haters and your hostiles. And I would estimate that at most, those hostiles only make up maybe 10% of the party, if that. And they have lost a lot of their capital. They've lost a lot of their influence and their credibility because they have gotten increasingly hysteric over time as more and more of the Mises people join the party. They're the ones who are showing up. They're the ones who are creating new counties. They're the ones knocking doors. They're getting ballot petition signatures and doing the work. And reasonable people, even if they're not Mises, see this and are starting more and more to understand that and contrast it with what the hysterics are saying about us. And it's pushing people who are not Mises towards our side more and more and more. And now we're at a point because we've had such an overwhelming and dominant victory that a lot of these hostile, hysteric people are leaving. And everybody that wants to work together is kind of the thing that's left over. And with that bash, we had a couple of goals with that. And I think we achieved them. You know, one of the main reasons that I wanted Zuby out is because he is somebody who has not traditionally been connected to the Libertarian Party or connected to the caucus. And I wanted to bring somebody like that out to frankly impress him. You know, I wanted to show him our community. I wanted to show him our culture and our energy and, you know, maybe start to form that connection and get someone like him involved. And then the other big goal is there was hundreds of people, I'm sure, who were in that room that are not Mises. But at the end of the day, if Ron Paul's coming, you're coming. You know, like there's a lot of people who were fans of Ron Paul and maybe they got turned on to the ideas by Ron Paul, but they didn't go full Hoppe and they didn't go full Rothbard and they didn't, you know, go all the way down the Austrian school rabbit hole and all that kind of stuff. But they still hold that special place in their heart as the guy that turned him on. So my hope was to bring those people in through Ron and that Ron would do what he always does, which is bring everybody together. And that by doing that, other people who are not Mises would start to see our culture and maybe it would click in their minds of, oh, I see what's going on now. And I think we achieved that. Tell us about the margins by which some of these victories occurred. I mean, they were big, big margins, convincing, not 50% plus one. Oh, yeah. I mean, Angela, so by the time Angela won, she won with 69% of the vote. And it just seemed to get wider from there because I think some people were demoralized and started to leave the floor. And I mean, Karen Ann Harlos won with, I think, 71%. And then well, not- bear, bear in mind, Angela had two major opponents. Yeah. So it's not even like 69 to 31 against one other person. She had two other people, plus some write-ins and stuff. Yeah. And people had a very strong response to her debate, a very strong response to her talk at the bash. And, you know, I think the irony of the whole situation is, is I saw more unity at this convention than I've ever seen in the Libertarian Party ever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting and, and very encouraging. Now, here's the thing I was thinking about. In the past, like when I went to the convention in 20, I spoke at the convention also in 2016. And I would walk around and there would be all these older people. And when I say older people, as I'm about to hit 50 this year. So I'm thinking like mid 60s, not old necessarily, but older. Okay. And, and there, I saw a lot of like 65 ish men I'd never seen before, never heard of. 
apparently they just don't interact with any of the libertarian circles I do at all. And they're just prancing around the convention, you know, while we were trying to get anybody but Gary Johnson nominated. And I, the choices weren't exactly what we wanted, but we were trying to get anybody other than Gary Johnson. And these were the, you know, well, we're the adults in the room and I've got my Gary Johnson sticker and we're going to nominate Gary Johnson. And that was what they, apparently every four years, they show up and they make sure that the most boring possible person gets it. And I don't know what motivates them or who these people even are, but they walked around that convention like they owned the place. Now, fast forward to 2022, they don't own the place. A much, much younger group of people walked around with confidence and swept away all the dead wood and replaced it with young, energetic, smart, knowledgeable people. So what I want to know is not the idiots who, anybody accusing you of being a white supremacist or whatever, it should just be ignored. I mean, every, any reasonable person knows that this is all nonsense. Right? Any, any reasonable person. So just forget it. I'm thinking instead just about the old guard. These people who probably don't call you names. They probably don't even, aren't even aware that those names are in circulation. <laughs> These people are completely isolated from everything. I'm curious about their reaction, because I think those people are so isolated. They come every four years, they nominate a Gary Johnson type. They get their news from the LP News newspaper they get in the mail. They probably don't even know we exist. And then suddenly, this thing clocks them over the head. How do those people respond? Like, what the hell just happened here? There's multiple sects of these people. They don't all fall into one category. And there's people who are maybe jaded or they're really upset that we kind of represent a different direction or a different strategic outlook. But then there's another sect of people that I think actually makes up the majority of this old guard, that they don't really care about caucuses. They don't really care about the internal fighting and all this stuff. These are just people who just want to see good things happen. They just want to see county parties get spun up. They just want to see people get on the ballot. They just want to see doors being knocked for campaigns. And they don't care who does it. And they're not interested in getting involved in the fights, even. Sometimes if it, it seems pretty reasonable to get involved, given how bad some of the corruption got. But those people, I think, are the ones that we stand to work with the most because we are the ones doing that. And you know, now we have the onus is on us to prove that we do care about these things. And I think if we do that, that they are going to work with us. They're going to help guide us. They're going to help us with the knowledge that they do have. And you know, the other people are going to leave. And there's this big talk about, oh man the millennial libertarians just kind of took it over from the boomer libertarians and they don't have any institutional knowledge. And I think that's not true because first of all, just in the caucus, the amount of talent that has come in the caucus in, in the past two years since 2022 is the thing that enabled us to win in such a dominant fashion. Our ability to organize, our ability to data gather, to kind of have a very strong pulse on where we stand and where the holes are, where we need to improve, that all happened because of the influx of talent. And I think that's going to be a trend. We are getting professionals, IT professionals, video professionals, marketing professionals, business professionals that are coming in in droves. And I think that there is, you know, because the party has been so insular, we forget how much talent exists in the wider movement that to this point has been kind of disgusted away. So, you know, one of my big goals in the immediate aftermath of Reno is to start calling leaders of different groups of people and be the liaison and say, okay, how can the party slash the caucus provide value for you to get you involved and get your people involved? And once you start growing the party, that institutional knowledge is going to come with it because you're getting all of these different professionals. It might look a little different than how it's been done in the past, but I think the times call for that. Hey folks, Woods here with an important message as Father's Day approaches. You do not want to get your father another predictable gift. Get him something he really wants. Now, what does your dad want? Well, dads want steaks. You won't find a better gift than Omaha Steaks. Visit omahasteaks.com, type Woods in the search bar, and order the Dads Want Steaks package. I've been ordering from Omaha Steaks for years and years. I myself got this Dads Want Steaks package, and it is delicious. And by the way, the Dads Want Steaks package takes you back to a time before mass inflation and shortages. Because for just $99, this limited time package includes 16 mouth-watering entrees he's guaranteed to love, like smoky, tender bacon-wrapped filet mignons, gourmet jumbo franks, and their air-chilled boneless chicken breasts. And for a sweet finish, delicious caramel apple tartlets. I'm getting hungry just thinking about them. 
And as a special gift for my listeners, when you type Woods in the search bar and order the Dad's Want Steaks package, you'll also get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. These burgers are full of bold, beefy flavor made from 100% Omaha Steaks, and now they're bigger than ever at a whopping six ounces. I just grilled some the other night, and they are juicy and delicious. So don't wait. Send Dad more than just a gift. Send him an experience he'll love and can share with you. Go to omahasteaks.com and type Woods into the search bar and order the Dad's Want Steaks package. You'll get 16 entrees and four desserts, plus eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword woods. I want you to spell out exactly how overwhelming this victory was. Give me the numbers, exactly what happened. So we were basically 70 30ing them. So we were 70% of the room, they were 30% of the room. Maybe 10% of that 70, 12% of that 70 was what we call friendlies. So they might not have been Mises people per se that voted with every single thing we did. But yeah, we were winning by 70, 30 types of margins, which when you consider how this works, like you have 50 state parties, they have their own conventions that elect delegates. And we basically had to win in the majority of those state conventions and then mobilize to help support all of those people to get out. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do to, to get a 70, 30 result like that. So that's kind of the margin that we were winning most of these races. And we swept every single seat on the LNC. There are 17 voting positions plus those regional alternates, and we won every single one of them. And that was a surprise even to us because for various reasons, I won't get into all the boring details, but for various reasons, we didn't think that we were going to win two of those regions. And even those, due to some extremely ridiculous tactics that were being used by the opposition, basically one of the regions was blown up and didn't even exist anymore going into that convention, that region was somehow reconstituted and then we won that region. You know, another region was, because that other region was blown up, was trying to gerrymander a bunch of non mesa states into their region so that they could get two seats. They failed spectacularly at that. And so that region stayed pretty much the same. We won that region. So we completely swept the board. We completely swept the judicial committee, which is essentially the court system for the party. And we also got several, what I consider to be really important platform changes, because what we were looking to do was not just win the leadership, but change the culture of the party. And again, I think we've done that. Well, you can say that again. And I guess the gala event is supposed to be some kind of big fundraiser, and it didn't raise much money. And for some reason, I heard some people trying to blame our side for that, but you know, they were in charge, they organized this gala. But- Angela McArdle, the newly elected chair, got up there at the end. And this was after we had the room until the end of the day. I mean, really, literally the end of the day, midnight. But the AV had been cut off by that point. So you guys were prepared enough to have brought bullhorns for precisely this eventuality, which could have been used in all kinds of situations. If the other side had filibustered or just deliberately drawn it out, we would still be able to communicate. So she stood up there with a bullhorn and said, look, I'm going to be straight with you guys. We didn't raise much money with that gala last night. So I need people to come up here and become lifetime members right now to get an influx of cash. And the result has been over 400 grand raised, just like that, by people we were told would never, they don't know how to raise money because they're not the, well, I guess we do. I guess we do know how to raise money. Yeah, I mean, let me let me take a step back there because that's actually another thing that I thought was a very decisive part of the entire convention. Because- after we swept all of the races, I mean, they were forced to accept that, but they kind of got into emergency mode and filibuster mode because one of the platform changes that we made was we removed the pro-choice abortion plank and replaced it with nothing. And that seemed to be the Alamo for them. There was a misconception that the entire convention had a hard stop at three o'clock because we would lose the room at three o'clock when, as you said, it turns out we only lost the AV. And I'm pretty sure, you know, there's a viral video going around of Nick Sarwark pretending to be elbowed and raising a scene. And the reason he did that was to take but, by the way, attention... Who is, who is Nick? Not everybody knows this inside baseball stuff, remember? I see. So, Who's so, Nick Sarwark? So Nicholas Sarwark is the very disgraced former chair of the Libertarian Party who kind of, I would say, spearheaded this shift of taking the party in a progressive left direction as well as an overly politicized direction where we might front a candidate like Bill Weld because he can get money and votes in the short term as opposed to 
a strong messenger that can infect the culture so that we infect minds for the long term. And there was all these dilatory tactics to try to time us out to three o'clock to prevent us to getting to a vote on that abortion plank. And, and I think it was actually a very decisive thing when we pulled the bullhorns out because they thought, okay, the mics are going to go off, the room's going to go out, we'll at least keep the abortion plank. And once we showed up with the bullhorns and, and found out we don't need the microphones, we don't need the screens, we got the room until midnight, I really think that was when their spine fully broke because the message there is, you are not going to screw us. There's nothing you can do. We're here to do a job and we're going to do it. So we did it. We removed the, it was a pro-choice abortion plank. So we removed that. We replaced it with nothing. We added support for secession back into the platform, which is, I thought, very, very important. We added definitions of property and aggression to the platform. And the, and the, the thought process there is sometimes you get these quote-unquote libertarian socialists that come around and they'll say things like rent is theft or employment is theft and things like that. And, and basically, the platform is, to its credit, very, very strong on the centrality of property rights, but it did not have a definition of aggression. And if you don't anchor the concept of aggression to a property rights understanding, you then get to arbitrarily redefine it so that employment is aggression because it's exploiting the workers and you know all this nonsense. So we wanted to completely get rid of that and enshrine the Rothbardian vision in the party. So we did that with that one. We strengthened the foreign policy outlook. And, oh man, I feel like there's one other important one that I'm forgetting. But the secession one, the property one, and, oh, the woke plank. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the woke plank, you know, which is an otherwise really good plank. But there was a poison pill sentence in that plank of, we condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant. When libertarians are not about thought crime, we are about self-ownership, aggression, and property rights. And that was always kind of a, used as a dialectic. It was always used to bash people over the head. Bigotry is a wantonly defined term as well. And it was specifically used to purge 47 people in the Massachusetts State Party. Anybody that doesn't agree with a leftist is a bigot. So it was always this kind of cultural Marxist dialectic that was used. And you know, one of the goals that we wanted to do again was to change the culture of the party. So by getting rid of that woke language, the way that we see it is that we are now perhaps the only institution in the country, when you combine getting rid of that and the totality of our leadership victories, we are now perhaps the only institution in the country that has shaken off wokeism. And I think that's like narratively really exciting. Yes, it's very important. And then, of course, you get all the dopes coming out and saying, the Libertarian Party has removed the phrase about bigotry being irrational and repugnant. That's all you need to know. No, all I need to know about you is that you have the IQ of a tomato. Because if you don't understand how the regime's language is used, the word, quote, bigotry is used against anyone and, and anything who dissents from whatever the current preoccupation of the regime is. And of course, people want to think that you're Archie Bunker if somebody calls you a bigot. No, you, you're called a bigot, but not because you dislike people, but because the regime dislikes you. That's how the language is used. I have never in my life come across more vicious, miserable, rotten, hate-filled people than the kind of people who have come after you and me over the past however many years. I have never seen anything like this. These are not people, sorry, impossible, literally impossible, that these people are just full of a desire to see the brotherhood of man brought about in their lifetime. That is not what motivates them at all. Zero chance of that, nothing. So actually, the language was replaced by something that Spike Cohen wrote. Now, they used to like Spike Cohen, the other side. And now Spike Cohen is also a Nazi. And I mean, it's just unbelievable that you would have to deal with people who would look at our platform, which is as pure plumb line libertarian as you could possibly get. And just like the left, they think that's fascist. Just like the left. I wonder why, just like the left. Could it be the shoe fits? It would seem to indicate that, that it does. I mean, we've kind of got this one-two punch on the Mises Caucus platform of like, we have one plank where we basically describe identity politics as, as useless tribalism and, and we're not about it. And then we have the next one that's called the Lifestyles Plank, which basically says, look, you can live your life however you want, so long as you conform to the NAP. And that's really all that matters. And kind of the, the NAP is the non-aggression principle, again, for any new people. Gotcha, yes, the non-aggression principle. And, and 
what we're going for with that one two punch is that technically speaking, you can be a social justice warrior and be in the Mises caucus, or you can be a right winger and be in the Mises caucus, but you have to arrange your value hierarchy in such a way that decentralization, property rights, Austrian economics, being anti war, decentralization, all of these things must be higher in your value hierarchy than your identity stuff. And if you can't do that, we're probably not the caucus for you. And my observation has been that people who tend to personally align, maybe culturally more traditional or more on the right, they just appear to have a much easier time arranging their value hierarchy in such a way, whereas people who maybe come from a progressive orientation have a lot of trouble arranging their value hierarchy in such a way. So I don't know what to do with that, but it's not really up to me. And yeah. Well, look, let me tell you something. It surprised me not long ago when I did a kind of informal poll among my folks. Where did you come from before you were a libertarian? Did you come from the left? Did you come from the right? Well, the caricature of me would say that probably 100% of them, they probably all came from the, the, you know, whatever, the Ku Klux Klan or, you know, all this absurdity. And about a third of them came from the left. And that was a real surprise to me that a third of them came from the left. And I wasn't even really trying to get them. I generally try to talk to people who are the way I used to be. And I was never on the left. And yet somehow I accidentally corralled them in and they're just as good. They are every bit as good as the people who have come in from the the so-called right. What I really think should be our goal is to reach anybody who feels politically homeless right now. And I can imagine a lot of Democrats after COVID feel pretty politically homeless. But also for the same reason, I can imagine there are a lot of Republicans who feel like the Republicans are constantly stabbing them in the back. If you're politically homeless and you're willing to listen to our message, then I don't see why we shouldn't make an attempt to bring you over. But there is, unfortunately, there are some people in the Libertarian Party who just, whatever the regime's moral priorities are, they adopt them instantly. Or whatever the regime tells them about, if the regime tells them Anthony Fauci is the expert, well, Anthony Fauci is the expert. You know, you're embarrassing the party by being a quote-unquote conspiracy theorist by saying that he's been wrong repeatedly. Well, look, he has been wrong repeatedly, right? So if the regime says the worst people in the world are right-wing dissidents, you know, the worst people in the world are people who won't just get on board with nice Republicans like George W. Bush, well, then that's what these libertarians adopt. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if, at least if they would respect George W. Bush. George W. Bush was way worse than Marjorie Taylor Greene. Way worse, way worse, way, way, way worse by any possible metric. Now, I don't know very much about Marjorie Taylor Greene, but I know she didn't favor mass murder. You know, I know that. And yet for some reason, these are the sorts of libertarians who when John McCain dies, They'll say, now I'm not saying that you have to dance on his grave, but they will issue the official, well, John McCain was a wonderful public servant who they've gone that whole way. So of course they hate somebody who is not for John McCain or for Hillary Clinton. And yet these are precisely the people who are our natural constituents, people who look at the choices we're given, whether they're on the left or the right. And they say, this range of choices is ridiculous. The range of choices is basically all people who love central banking, love a in effect, a planned financial system that love the bipartisan foreign policy apparatus that will impose this crazy regime on us because the quote-unquote experts tell us to. Yeah, anybody who dissents from that is my friend, left or right. And that is our natural constituency. And for two solid years, those people on the left and the right were sitting there waiting for somebody to reach out to them, and nobody ever did because the people in charge were too busy lecturing libertarians about, your messaging isn't quite right. You have to be a serious person like us. Get bent. Yeah, I mean, this is the truly disappointing folly of the people who do place something like bigotry at the top of their concern list at the present time. You know, we're at a time where We're in the immediate aftermath of the code regime, the lockdowns and the vaccine passports. The scales have fallen from the eyes of countless numbers of people that tyranny really can happen here. That veneer is gone. You know, how long have libertarians been saying that the public school system is indoctrination centers for the regime? That is now seen plainly and openly with how progressivism is being pushed on children. And parents are finally becoming skeptical of that. So like you have the highest numbers that I, I know of that have ever happened with homeschool, charter schooling, people skeptical of the school systems, the trust in media is at an all-time low. And the only people who are watching it are people that we don't stand to really convert anyway. 
But most people are now getting their information and disseminating their ideas through long-form podcasts, whether that's Joe Rogan, whether that's Tim Pool, whether that's Lex Friedman or Adam Carolla or you name it. And the theme that seems to unite all of these new audiences is that, you know, I'm not saying that these guys are all Rothbardian anarchists, but they all want more liberty compared to what's happened the past couple of years. And we can work with that. And there's so much opportunity. I'm I'm a white pill guy. These opportunities really excite me because, you know, it's unfortunate that the prices are going up at the rate that they're going up, but it presents an opportunity for us to once again, explain that the Federal Reserve is the and, and the inflation and the printing of the dollar and all those Trump checks and and all of that has is what is directly responsible for all of these price increases. And we as libertarians, specifically as Misesian libertarians, we are the ones that have it right on money. We have answers for all of the big issues that plague our day. And for the first time, we have access to the largest platforms in the world through people like Dave Smith, through people like Maj Toure to where we can actually flesh these ideas out in a long format, comprehensive manner. And I truly believe that when we are given the opportunity to do that, we can change minds. And when you change minds, you change actions. And so for me, yes, the specter of war with Russia is incredibly scary. And yes, the inflation is scary. And yes, there's all these things that are going on. But I also think it's almost archetypal the way that this is happening and and that it's always darkest before dawn. And that If you focus on the darkness, you're going to feel that and you're going to act that out. But if you focus on the opportunity that that this represents, that's what will manifest in front of you. And I think we have to really focus with that. And I think we now have a libertarian party that understands this, that understands that we have to be a cultural movement and successful as a cultural movement before we could ever even hope to be successful as a political movement. So what's next? Well, what's next is... There's a lot that's next is the short answer for that. But, you know, on the horizon, if we have it our way, we want Dave Smith to run for president with Maj Toure as his vice president. They have together have access to so many people through their combined resources. Dave is a friend of Joe Rogan's. He gets on there with multiple times. You know, Maj, he gets on the main stage of CPAC. He gets on Infowars. He uh, is shouted out by some of the biggest rappers in the world on, on their tracks. He's friends with Kwame Brown. He's got a huge following, former NBA player. Dave has access to Gutfeld. He has access to Kennedy. You know, you put these two together, you're talking in the tens of millions, day one audience. And they're such good speakers. They command a room. They command respect that I think we can reach more people than we ever have before. Now, that's something that's kind of more on the horizon. What's next in the immediate? So we, the caucus, have spent, I would estimate, about 80% of our efforts on the takeover of the Libertarian Party. And that is now over. So we are now going to be ramping up our efforts on the other two prongs of our three-prong strategy, which is issue coalitions, You know, meaning take stock of, are you in a blue town? Are you in a red town? If you're in a blue town, I've got Brianna's law legislation for you, or I've got decriminalization legislation for you. If you live in a red town, I've got surveillance state legislation for you or gun sanctuary legislation for you. Start being the catalyst to move these issues forward through city council. Start those nullification movements. Scaling that up, that's actually a role that I am now going to be shifting into. I am now going to be the national issues guy for the caucus and forming relationships with these issue groups and basically trying to sell them on the fact that, hey, I command an organizational infrastructure that was capable of taking over the third largest party in the country, and I can aim that at other things I need you to tell me where the hot spots are for this issue and I will deploy people. That's going to be my personal big focus. We're going to be ramping up support for local level candidates. We're going to be upping our educational outreach. You know, I have a new podcast called Ask an Austrian where we, it's exactly what it sounds like, where we uh, take proud questions about the Austrian school or about economics generally. And we get some of the scholars at the Mises Institute to answer those questions. You know, we want to expand on the Take Human Action Tour concept that we started last year to go and do college outreach and recruitment. And we also want to invest in more events slash culture building and bringing people together in real life to strengthen and embolden and grow that community element. And I think if you take all of those things and put them together, I don't know what else could possibly be done or what is a more viable strategy than that. All right. So if people now have some interest in the Libertarian Party, What is their next step? 
So you should go to lp.org and become a member. It's $25. And if you can give more than $25, you should do that. But right now is the time to do it because there has been an influx of membership. There has been an influx of donors. You know, you mentioned that $400,000. And we want to make the new slate look good. We want to show that we are action takers. We want to show that we will get involved, that we're not just edgelords or whatever. So we want to make them look good, grow those numbers. So lp.org slash join and become a member of the Libertarian Party. And then if you also want to go to takehumanaction.com, from there, you will see our store. You can sign up to our email list, which will get you involved at the state level as well. And you can donate to us as well, because we're still going to need money to do these educational tours. We're going to need money to support these decentralist-based candidates. We're going to need money to organize for 2024 to get that Dave Smith ticket. So, you know, we both need your help. All right. Well, I'm going to have that link up at tomwoods.com slash 2137. And I just want to say thank you for doing this because it needed to be done. And and even for people out there who are just resolutely non-political, I'm sure you can agree that if there's an institution out there with the word libertarian in it, and it's a grotesque embarrassment that has only the most tenuous connection to libertarianism, then that needs to be changed. And changed, it indeed has been. So thank you, thank you, Michael, for your vision and your hard work. Last comment I'll make is that at the bash, Ron Paul told the crowd, he felt the energy, he felt the enthusiasm, and he told us that the revolution is alive and well. And that's what I always wanted to go for. That's what I always wanted to achieve. And the community and the element of it seems to be the same as what permeated that revolution. And that is something that makes me incredibly proud. And there's so many young people that didn't experience it that now have the chance to experience that with us. And I ask that they all come, even if you're not into politics, just come for the community and you might find yourself getting active anyway. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks again, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, tomorrow, our old friend Germinal Van joins us once again. Germinal immigrated to the United States from the Ivory Coast back in 2010. And it's astonishing to say of a man in his early 30s that he has written 23 books. Okay, this is one of these people who makes me feel like a lazy bum. There's a handful of them. Germinal's one of them. It seems like we just had him on to talk about his book about the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, in particular, the economic policy. And I wrote the foreword to that book. But now he's got a book on a completely different topic, but by far his most controversial book yet. So we're going to have a great time talking about that. I may well do two episodes with Germinal talking about his brand new book. I don't know where he gets the energy to write 23 books and he's in his early 30s and he has a day job. I don't know. I don't know. We'll can see if we can unlock that mystery. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.